the more technical questions to be directed at Ivan, and um, hopefully he can answer some of those questions that, that Tom and I haven't been able to, to fully answer at some of the past workshops. Um, so with that, I'm going to dive into the presentation. Um, as the council has been involved in, and planning board and, and public, we've had a number of meetings over the last few months on on the various versions of this proposal. Um, we've got a lot of good feedback at those meetings, including the workshop back in early September, I think September, September 3rd. Um, and so I just want to walk through some of, the, some of the higher level feedback that we've gotten that's really informing this latest proposal uh, to the council for tonight's workshop. Um, there's been concerns about you know, new towers in residential neighborhoods, residential developments being closer to homes. We've been trying to take that account into account all along, but this proposal really tries to get at that in a, a more meaningful way through um, much higher thresholds for, for new towers. There's been some concerns about sort of a proliferation of new towers in town or a number of a large number of new towers, um, given um, the expansive area that's been considered for allowing new towers. And, and along those same lines, there's been some objection to the entire rural districts being allowed for in terms of new, new cell towers or transmission towers, and that being too large of an area of town. And as we've been trying to address um, all along, there's, there's just general concerns about potential impacts on scenic views of transmission towers and property values and, and really wanting to see the visibility of towers minimized through good mitigation. Um, and the planning board members at the workshop in, in early September also, more generally speaking, we just wanted more tools and standards to kind of work with. Um, when given that they're the primary review board of new transmission towers. Can everyone see, or shall I have it projected here? Is it okay? Okay, see. So this has resulted in, in really a new proposal, and if, um, you know, based on tonight's workshop and, and future action by the council, it's, if the new proposal or some modification of it it's, is more acceptable to the council, the staff's recommendation would be to, to actually replace that through amendment um, with a new proposal. And that's the way we've drafted it. It was getting much too busy with redlining and strike throughs. So um, the material that you've been provided for tonight's meeting is the new proposal. It doesn't show changes from the past version, just for your understanding as to how it compares to first reading. Um, so it's an entirely new proposal, and it's really designed to avoid residential neighborhoods and areas uh, in general. And it tries to do that in a, a few different ways. Um, one is the, the hierarchy siting process or the priority siting process that we talked a little bit about at the last council meeting where the rural areas are the least preferred out of the other options. It uses the idea of an overlay district for new towers for more limited parts of our rural zones and an overlay for non-zoning geeks is um, basically a, a zoning district on top of the regular zoning district. So a zoning overlay can allow or restrict something um, in more specific areas and then the, the regular zoning, the underlying zoning still applies. So what's being considered is an overlay district that would allow for transmission towers in a limited parts of the community less broadly than the past proposal. And the other key uh, component of this proposal is to set a, a 25 acre minimum lot size or minimum parcel size for any new towers in the overlays, which would be in rural or residential areas, which is a, a significant acreage threshold trying to get at the concerns of proximity to homes, neighbors, uh, views, et cetera. With a parcel that size, there's a lot of opportunity to, to be away from abutters and to be screened and, and isolated from the surrounding area. So in terms of the siting si hierarchy or the location priorities, most preferred is would be to co-locate on existing towers. Um, and this would be part this is part of the proposed amendment. If that's not possible and it's justified that that's not possible, the planning board would then consider with the applicant locating a new tower in an industrial district. Um, if that's not possible and is justified, 
Um, the applicant and planning board would be considering stealth antennas on buildings, within buildings, on structures, uh, which wouldn't be visible, like a transmission tower. Uh, again, if that's determined to, to not be feasible by the applicant and the board, then that would be the opportunity to look at a new tower in the overlay area. So that's a, a rigorous process that the planning board would go through with the applicant, and there's criteria for justification to move from one to the next in the, in the language. Another ingredient is trying to enable what's preferred, making it easier to do what's preferred. Um, and so the highest priority or the most preferred is to co-locate on an existing tower. So with the, the language and the allowances for towers increasing the height limit um, from 100 to 130 to 150, right now 100 is the max under our current standards, that enables some potential for locating on existing towers or or improving existing towers. Um, some may not be able to be expanded based on engineering issues, but the, at least it creates the opportunity for existing towers to be used uh, more fully than, than today. Another encouragement uh, for the industrial zone is there's no lot, minimum lot size for putting a new tower in the industrial districts. There's a 100% there's setback, a lesser setback than going to the rural areas of town. Um, so that's another uh, a way to encourage um, use of the industrial districts for, for new facilities. And thirdly, is to enable a, a wider application of stealth antennas, um, termed telecommunications facilities in the ordinance uh, on existing structures or buildings um, in various areas of town. Um, and by that I mean adding an antenna to uh, the roof of an office building that might be tall enough to provide some coverage, um, putting an antenna on a uh, taller transmission line. There's a transmission <coughs> corridor in the western part of town that could accommodate potentially some antennas. Um, approaches like that that aren't adding new towers to um, areas of town. So if those aren't pursued, um, the last option is is a tower in the overlay district. So we spent some time looking at a way to establish where the overlay district should be. This map uh, was produced by Ivan that that shows existing coverage in town um, plus the addition of a tower in the Pleasant Hill industrial area where we've heard from um, the industry that they're interested in locating a tower, which is a preferred location under this zoning scheme versus the rural areas. And so we added a tower in that area to show, generally speaking, what the, the good in-building, in-vehicle, and then not so good coverage there is in the community. So this, we've shown you a few different maps like this over the last few months. To remind you, green is um, fairly good in-building coverage in Scarborough. The, Brownish orange shows fairly reliable in vehicle, but not necessarily in building coverage. And then the white are the areas where coverage is a lot less reliable. Um, so using this map, it informed us as to where some, probably some good locations would be to allow for towers to fill these um, coverage holes. One area is the far eastern part of town, uh, a corridor along Black Point Road. Um, outlined in red there, where, there, where there's uh, more limited coverage. Another area is um, kind of south of Pine Point Road towards the Old Orchard Beach um, boundary with Scarborough. Another is an area uh, between Payne Road, Gorham Road, and Sawyer Road. There's a, there's a, a gap there um, that would be well served by a uh, new facility. And then um, a broader area west of the turnpike where coverage is, is certainly more limited. Um, so using this work by Ivan and generally speaking good and bad coverage in the community, this informed this map for consideration by the council as the overlay district. Um, 
And so to, to talk through this map a little bit, the red striped areas, so the red and white striped areas are, would be the overlay districts. And they're in the four locations just outlined by the coverage map, uh, an area along Black Point Road, um, kind of north of Proud Snack in the vicinity of Spurwink and Black Point Road intersection, that area. Um, the area close to Old Orchard Beach south of Pine Point Road, that area near Payne Road and Gorham Road, and then uh, a broader area west of the highway where there's a much larger um, area of limited coverage. The four red areas are the industrial zones. So that's where towers are already allowed and that we are trying to encourage them also to locate. Um, so I'm going to show you maps zoomed in on some of these areas. Um, and not only would these areas help in terms of improving coverage and in a more limited way, limited geography way, in terms of not being throughout the RF district or other residential zones in town, but there are also areas that are characterized by large parcels. Um, there, there are not a large number of neighborhoods in these areas. This map shows the area south of Pine Point Road along the Old Orchard Beach boundary. Um, I realize it's hard to see from your seats the, the details of the map, um, but the PowerPoint handouts have them and I can provide them also um, after the meeting. But there's a number of parcels that are anywhere from 25 to 75 acres. Um, there, in this particular area, there aren't established neighborhoods within the overlay. Um, and there's also a handful of town-owned properties in, in this particular area. So the town can, if the town wanted to uh, work with a carrier, they could, they could do that and the council can control that process. These two maps zoom in on the aerial photography of the other two areas on the eastern side of town, on the east side of the turnpike. Uh, the one in the, the top left is the area along Payne Road. Uh, it includes part of Scarborough Downs, um, the Warren Woods property, and four other parcels. Uh, a few of those are landlocked. And then the, uh, the map in the lower right is the area in the vicinity of Black Point Road, uh, north of Proud Snack, that also has a variety of large parcels. Um, there's not a lot of denser residential neighborhoods in that and within the boundaries of this overlay. So there's the overlay concept to be more specific in the RF as to where towers could be applied for. There's the other key threshold, which is the expectation of 25 acres in the overlay to apply for a tower. Um, this is just an example. It's not an application uh, of where this would go, but I'd found a 35-acre site um, and outlined it here in town and then showed also uh, there's a white dot in the middle and then a, um, a red circle around that that shows what a 200-foot setback would be to the white dot would be the tower and that's what a 200-foot setback would be, would look like on that parcel. Um, and under the proposed language, the planning board would have the ability to require anywhere from 100 to 200 foot setback uh, for a tower to any adjacent property line. <coughs> this parcel size well exceeds the setback, um, and that sort of illustrates um, you know, how tucked away a, a, a tower could be on a 25 acre parcel. Percent, not, fo not footage, 100% setback. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's Correct. No, it's 200 percent of the tower height. Excuse me, and I marked that wrong on yeah. <laughs> on this. So this needs to be. Um, I think the the diameter is shown correctly. I noted it wrong on on here. So it's not 200 feet. Like, thank you, Bill. It's 200 percent of the height of the tower. So, for example, if there's a 130 foot tower, then the tower setback to the property line would need to be at least 260 feet. So in this example, the, that diameter is, is 520 feet. Um, yeah, where is this? I'm sorry. 
Where is this? This is just a, a random parcel in town. Oh. Just to show um, proximity of a parcel to surrounding surrounding lots. Give you a sense for the size of a 25-acre parcel. This isn't a site that the wireless providers are looking for. Oh, I know. <laughs> sure. Um, so to, to give the council and the public a sense for the type and number of 25-acre parcels there are in town that would be within the overlay, this map attempts to do that. Um, so outlined in red are the four overlay areas. Um, okay. And then shown in blue, fully in blue, are parcels within those areas that are at least that are 25 acres or more, um, and that shows you that there is a selection of parcels um, in those areas, and and yeah, sort of their proximity to residential areas, etc. Um, I would say that mm -hmm. given the other standards in the ordinance, you're not likely to see. Um, you know, you're likely to see maybe four to six towers overall added to the community in the next five to ten years based on this methodology. I mean, there's a number of parcels where they could go, but in each, particularly the three overlays east of the turnpike, would likely accommodate a tower because the ordinance is expecting that all the carriers co-locate on the tower. Um, so, just to to prevent concerns about all these 25-acre parcels accepting towers, that's not going to be the case. It's just showing the sort of the variety of parcels that could accommodate a tower. The first one that goes in, then other carriers need to co-locate on that tower. They're not going to be allowed to locate another tower right next door because um, they want their own tower. So that's just, part of the regulation. Just if I could, I think it's worth noting that what's uh, this graphic, uh, I would suggest, really shows worst case scenario. That's, uh, although it's theoretically possible that a tower is located in each of the overlay zones, uh, as Dan points out, those three zones, the smaller ones to the east of the turnpike, won't be able to accommodate more than one each, for sure. Perhaps the larger one to the north of and west of the turnpike could handle multiple towers, given its size. And, and beyond that, we're showing all the properties at 25 acres or greater. I just I want to make sure everyone appreciates that, that doesn't mean that there's going to be a tower in every one of those sites. This really should be viewed as kind of the uh, the worst worst case scenario. Also, sort of geometry wise, some of these parcels won't be able to meet some of the other standards in here um, because we're talking about a minimum setback of. 100 to 200 percent of the height of a tower, and there's <coughs> just looking quickly. There's a number of parcels in here that that are narrow, that you know, that don't have the right shape, and therefore necessarily the right buffering and those and the right setbacks to accommodate a tower. Just a final comment, Dan touched on it, but within each of those overlay zones, there's a fair amount of publicly controlled property, town-owned, land trust-owned, sanitary district. Uh, so this council. Is for obviously the town-owned property, controls whether a tower goes there or not. Uh, you, you have that full control. We could certainly light up this map and show all of those publicly controlled properties that fall, uh, that are 25 acres or greater in that area, just to give you further clarity on the point. So, I mean, other than the uh, more limited overlay areas and the, and the 25 acre minimum requirement, um, and the 100 to 200 percent setback, 100 to 200 percent setback of the height of a tower uh, in terms of distance to the property lines. There are some other kind of key components. Some of these we've already talked about, but it's worth covering again. Um, the current proposal would limit towers to 130 feet, most generally, um, but would have the allowance for the planning board to um, grant up to a 150-foot tower in special situations where that could enable more co-location more co to avoid a second tower. Um, and when the planning board 
in its judgment can determine that there's, in most cases, there's not a big visual difference in terms of its impact um, to abutters, to uh, the scenic views, et cetera. As we've talked about a lot, um, the language mandates co-location of multiple carriers on the same tower with at least three to be required and, and hopefully with additional work with the industry, more would locate on the, on the towers, but a minimum of three to, again, to reduce the overall number of towers in the community uh, and to centralize the locations of, of these providers. We've worked a bit on the, the standards um, for the planning board to, to give them some tools to analyze the visual impact and the views of towers from the surrounding areas, um, such as photo simulations, balloon tests, other methods, so that they can ask the applicant to, to go through those things and judge um, how well towers are screened and if there are impacts, how to, how to mitigate those um, through their review process. We've also included a requirement for the monopole style towers, but, also, but at the same time give the board additional tools in terms of working with applicants on further camouflaging them so they're, they're less visible um, from any locations that they, they are visible, that they blend in as best as possible. Um, and along those same lines, worked on the, the buffering and the landscaping requirements uh, including adding some language to give the board the ability to require easements or conservation restrictions within um, proximity to the tower so that if there's good buffering at the beginning of the project or as part of the review process that it's maintained, that's not lost over time um, and that can be maintained through those restrictions. Um, and lastly, we've gone back and, and really increased our teeth around the performance guarantee uh, of removing of abandoned towers. That's looking out a ways in the future, but that's been a concern about having infrastructure that's out there that's um, not being used anymore and, and having it be a skeleton on the landscape. So we want to, we've added some standards and a surety requirement that there is um, funding for that to come down once its useful life is over or, or it's no longer being utilized. Um, so that's a kind of a high-level presentation on, on the latest with um, the standards that are in your packages and the methodology on the overlay and <coughs> what that means in terms of areas of the community. Um, Ivan's here to, to help um, answer technical questions. I know there's been some out there for a few weeks or months now that we haven't fully answered, so he's here to, to help with that, and um, I'm certainly here to answer questions on on where we are and um, next steps. Okay, thank you, Dan. Okay, Ivan, do you have anything to add to that? Can I ask him a question? Uh, yeah, no. it's a presentation for us. Then, yes, you can. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it up to the board. I wasn't really going to add. Okay. Other than I've been working with Dan. Okay. To, to get to this point. Okay, <coughs> so now, now we'll start with questions. Council Benedict. It appears that the in the uh, larger map mm -hmm. that at least a third, and I think it's probably more than that, but at least a third of the town is not served. What is intended to be done, especially the far side, because you've got a, a, a length that goes up Broadturn Road Ashwamp Road, and that's a good five, six, seven miles to the Buxton border. Are there any plans of what? Are you referring to this overlay map? Yes. Okay. So if it's west of the turnpike, Ashwamp, towards Buxton, that area has been included in the overlay because there is poor coverage and there are a variety of parcels that are 25 acres. So under this proposal, uh, the wireless industry could come in and I, I think there might be some misunderstanding, Dan. If you could toggle back to this map. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah? Just, for, uh, just to reiterate, what's shown in green on this map are those areas that are currently well served. 
and, and Pan is <coughs> marginally or decently served. So then if you go back to the overlay district, mm -hmm. back, toggle back. Oh, sorry, I have to do this. Oh, back, yep. So what's shown in the, in the cross-hatching uh, would in fact be the overlay areas where towers could go, and they mimic the areas of poor coverage. Does that make sense? This is the areas where they can go. Where they can go, yes. So the if they meet the criteria. Right. If they meet mm -hmm. the criteria, correct. Because mm -hmm. suppose there's no industrial land in that area? There's not on the southern half of um, West Scarborough, or the area west of the turnpike, correct. The, the only area west of the turnpike that has industrial opportunities is this little triangle shown in bright red. And that's uh, in the Holmes Road, Landfill, Beatrice Speedway area. What about the Southern Firewood Company on Mission Hill? They're not industrially zoned. Um, so they must have a yeah. forestry activity. I mean, that might that might be a rural. It's a rural use that might be Maybe permitted. Maybe some sort of grandfathered use. Okay, because you got three or at least two great big businesses there. You got a metal fabrication place right beside Firewood Road, which goes in off of Mission Hill. Mitchell Hill. Mitchell. Excuse me? Mitchell Hill. Mitchell Hill, sorry. Boston. Right. So you don't, no one's got any idea where anything is going to go in here? No, I'd, Ivan did some initial mapping um, that was shared with the council back in the spring that that was a very comprehensive approach to providing improved coverage that showed 10 or 11 towers. Um, and I believe based on that mapping, there was three or four towers shown on the west side of town that could serve West Scarborough in a really robust way, a really strong way. Um, that may or may not come to fruition based on what the wireless industry wants to do. And I think it's more reasonable to expect a couple towers uh, on the whole west side of town, and you know, maybe two to three, to provide fairly comprehensive coverage. Um, so this is trying to enable that, and there's such a wide variety of larger parcels on the west side of town that staff was reluctant to draw smaller overlays, because by doing that, we could end up causing more towers need to be built than, than necessary if we kind of arbitrarily picked locations on the west side of town versus allowing it to be done through the planning board. Is, is Fuller Farm an allowable place for a tower to go? I, I don't know the details of the conservation restrictions on on that, and it's a question for the land trust. I I suspect they're not allowed to do much in the way of development mm -hmm. on uh, conservation land. But it, as far as I was concerned, Jim, they've made a commitment to not putting any towers on their property, and so it would any any um, any permit. I mean, you'd have to have the landowner's permission, whether it was on wherever it would be. So. Um, the land trust has uh, told, told me that they're not interested. Their donors do not want it, so it won't happen. I've had a similar conversation with them, not specifically about Fuller Farm, but uh, they express no interest in having such facilities on, on their land. All set? Yep, thank All you. For now. Um, Council of St. Clair. Dan, can you go back to the slide that, um, I'm sorry to make you do this, but sure. um, where you're a 25 acre minimum, the overlay? So. Um, uh, the one, this example? Yeah. Or, okay. Mm -hmm. So, my issue with this is 
could that red circle be at the very edge of the 25 acres? Mm -hmm. It could. It's subject to planning board review. So, so I, mean, I mean, I'm just saying, if you've got 25 acres and you've got a house at the edge, or houses, or a neighborhood, Mm -hmm. at the edge of that 25 acres, someone could potentially put a tower at the edge of that 25-acre site if it, if it made it through the planning board. 260 feet back. Yeah, that's the, that's the right. proposal. Still, the planning board has the role of judging on a 25-acre parcel where the best location is. So that's subject to their scrutiny. If there's concerns by abutters about that, then that's entered into their process. Um, and also in terms of views of the tower, that's entered in their, their process. They can require, you know, illustrations and simulations of where the tower goes to, to cite it in the most screen place that they can cite it. Okay. I, I'm not, I'm still not. Exactly comfortable with yeah. that. But, and that's a good um, question. Uh, and mm -hmm. Can you clarify that the planning board can say no, you're not going to be able to put the uh, uh, set the, the tower at 260 feet nearest to a sideline that is occupied by homes? It can actually say no, you can't do that. You're going to have to put it over here, which is more remote from that area. Is that what we get with the planning board uh, discretion? The way it was written is the planning board has a 100 to 200 percent of the height of the tower setback wiggle room. There can be more, um, but that's, that would be something the applicant needs to agree to. Um, and the planning board has been given tools on making those judgments, such as views from the neighbors. If they're concerned about a view of the tower, then they can require the tower to be pushed further away from the abutter if there's concerns about a view from the road. That's the way it's intended to be set up is so that the setback can But at that point, a neighborhood's not going to have that much. I mean, they're, they're not going to really have a lot to go on. I mean, once it's had that in the, at, to, to, at the planning board, I mean, they can come to the meetings and say what they want to say, but um, I'm not comfortable with it being like the way that it is. I think it needs to be, there needs to be more writing there. I think we need, it needs to be tough, I mean, it needs to be tightened up somehow. It's just, that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, the other issue that I had um, is with the stealth locations. There's, a, I've been just mentioning there's language you can add about a minimum distance to the nearest structure as mm -hmm. well, not just property line. I mean, that's been done in other ordinances, so that's along the lines of, like, what you're getting at. Okay. Yeah. Uh, exactly. <clears throat> and I'm not, obviously, I'm not saying that one of these cell companies is, is going to be sneaky and try to come in and, and do something like that. I just feel like it's our responsibility to our people to make sure that this, since this ordinance is, is getting, you know, really looked at, that we need to make sure that this is perfect at this point. It should be, at least, in my opinion. Um, so I personally would like to see that happen, um, that language put in there. Um, Dan, the second thing I had was um, I'm uncomfortable with the stealth location. I know that we said, I know I've brought this up before. Um, I know I'm probably um, beating a dead horse. That's, that's a good, ex not, uh, that's a very bad analogy, but um, I don't like stealth locations. They ma it makes me uncomfortable, to be honest with you. Um, I, I feel like it's an opening. Um, it would be my, I would like to see it gone from the process, um, from the steps. You know, we have the steps of it. Um, I would like to see it gone from the steps. I just think it gives 
too much. It gives there's wiggle room again there for the cell phone towers to put these devices in places that they shouldn't be because of that one piece. Um, I'd like to see a, an amendment that removes that. Which one? Excuse me? Can you say again which one you thought sure. should be removed? Self. Oh, the self self self. locations. I just have an, I have an issue with that. I just feel like it gets it is too what? much. What, why remove the stove? I don't, I don't like it. I what think do you, what it, don't you like about it? I don't like the fact that it, it gives them an opportunity. I don't like where it is in that hierarchy, in the steps. I feel like it's, it's, the, it's the third one, or the third is there. It's the third one down, and I feel like it gives them too much of an opening. Yeah. Uh, I just was wondering if yeah. you realize that we already allow self. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, but I feel like I feel like we're changing. I mean, if we're making changes, I I don't. I'm just saying I don't like it. I, I I'm just asking other counselors to consider it. That's all. Um, my reasonings behind it are the fact that I feel like it, it gives people, it gives them an opening. No, just I'm not interrupting. I just no, no, I, I'm, I'm you, done. Uh, Dan, for the for the view in public, can you uh, define? Um, in the ordinance, d tell the people what the uh, limitations of stealth locations, the buildings that they're allowed in. Yeah, what what we're talking about are the ordinance calls them t um, telecommunication facilities. That's the zoning language for an antenna um, that's attached to a building or within a building to provide wireless service. So it's different from a tower. Transmission tower is a cell tower um, with antennas. A telecommunication facility is um, a building or a um, utility pole, what have you, that would have an antenna on it. So um, we're calling it in this pre presentation stealth because often they're they're within a steeple or within a, within a building or on a roof of a building that you can't see. So it's avoiding kind of the scenic impacts and, and those types of concerns um, by doing that. Um, so that's that's the subject matter. We're not talking about. As far as buildings go, does it um, in the ordinance? What buildings yeah. are they allowed in? Right now, the ordinance allows telecommunication facilities on municipal buildings or properties, or on places of worship, on churches. So, and that's a fairly limited number of buildings uh, in the community. So the proposed amendments were to allow them on on other privately owned buildings, like a taller office building, or if there's a tall um, building in a certain part of town, then an applicant could go to the planning board for a commercial building and add an antenna with their review, or go to the zoning board in a residential area and add an antenna, a stealth antenna but with their review. So that's what's my, my point is, you put it in a church, and most of our churches are located in residential areas. So that to me is not acceptable. I don't care. I don't care if you can see it. That's not my point. My point is not if you can see it. So then, um, in the so the when we, you talk about taller buildings, it would be in most of the tall buildings are industrial or, or commercial, zone. commercial I mean, zone. think of, there's not a lot of tall buildings in Scarborough. Um, they're right. usually two to three stories, but, you know, the main health office building is four stories. It's, I don't know if that makes sense for an antenna. There's a couple cell towers near that, but that's an example of a building that might be eligible if this was amended. That's, uh, or an example could be a church steeple as Councillor St. Clair. Yep. So when you... Also, when you talk about um, stealth on telephone poles. Yeah, maybe that's not entirely stealth. Um, but mm -hmm. an example from other communities, um, Yarmouth comes to mind because I drive by it often and see that they have wireless antennas on top of their, their um, transmission power lines that go from Cousins Island inland. Mm -hmm. We have some larger <coughs> transmission lines with taller... Poles. So that was another example of where they could go that's 
it's already infrastructure, it's already uh, in place, that might be an example of a structure that's not a building. I think what people worry about is the difference between transmission lines and the regular poles in the neighborhood. Regular utility speak poles. To that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I believe, and Ivan probably can speak better to that. Uh, that's typically the distributed antenna systems. Um, the wireless industry and the material they provided to us is not interested in doing those types of systems to provide cell coverage because they're mm -hmm. they're not that practical in in suburban applications. Because um, there's it's a lot of, I think cost and infrastructure for the kind of lack of density in Scarborough, but I think maybe Ivan, if you don't mind commenting on that. Yeah, a couple things. Uh, just let me go back to that stealth concern. Uh, be careful, actually, with that, because think of the scenario where you have an overlay and uh, an acceptable use is to put up a tower, and you get a 130-foot tower and an overlay, and a quarter of a mile down the road there's a church steeple. You're going to impact more people visually with that 130-foot tower, potentially, than you are with the antennas that are within a steeple. That's not my issue. I'm just telling. I'm just. And I'm, I'm, I'm just and laying I'm out the scenario. To you that that's not my issue. Okay, then. If, if you want to explain that issue, I'm more than happy I to. I did. I don't. I. I'm. It's. It's not the visual point of it. What's the I'm point? I'm not trying to. I'm trust me. I'm not trying to start an argument okay. here. That's, I'm just trying to explain to you. That's fine. That's that fine. The visual part of it is not my issue. Okay, I, I'm just laying out. That's a possible scenario that I could totally happen. I totally understand. Okay, and I don't. I don't want. I don't want Scarborough to turn into a place where we have we have towers all over the place. Right. I don't want that either. But. Right, and that's and that's where, you know, we tried to be strategic about the areas uh, that needed coverage and and developing an overlay that will satisfy mm -hmm. multitude of carriers uh, and a long-term plan right. for, and for I have, Scarborough. I have residents of Scarborough that are writing to me and saying that they'd rather have poor cell phone coverage mm -hmm. than towers or transmitters near their homes and their children. Mm -hmm. So it's, hard, it's, it's, it's a hard, it's that's, hard. That's fine. And that's certainly that's, you know, their right to, uh, uh, to, to you know, request that. That's, that, that's fine. Um, with respect to the utility poles, uh, high tension poles, those are um, uh, poles that carriers will mount on. Uh, they're, they're taller, you know, carrier, carry the, uh, the main transmission lines for utilities. The, the local uh, uh, telephone poles, the, the shorter poles, um, there are systems that are called uh, DAS systems, distributed antenna systems that mount equipment on those poles that are connected via fiber optics. Um, those systems uh, connect back to a head-end location, a carrier's uh, site somewhere uh, in the municipality, uh, and feed these uh, RF uh, transmitters and receivers on these poles uh, distributed throughout uh, an area. Uh, and those systems also are used primarily in buildings convention centers, airports, mm -hmm. tunnels, uh, where you can't get coverage from outside, inside, or you have capacity issues at airports, for instance, at terminals. You want dedicated capacity within the terminal. Mm -hmm. You don't want to take capacity from an outdoor uh, cell site. So um, there, there have been some uh, uh, of these DAS systems that have been implemented outdoors in communities. Nantucket did what's called a neutral host system that uh, an independent company came and built the system and went to the carriers and said, here, you can plug into my system and we're going to charge you monthly. Um, you know, that uh, has not really taken off uh, with the carriers. It's expensive. Um, and again, it, it, it's driven by where the people are, where the density is, and how much you're going to pay uh, to, to have infrastructure to serve those people. Certainly, there are applications for DAS. <coughs> Uh, in areas where you have, uh, you know, a, a, a small, um, uh, you know, maybe a, a along the shoreline, that you don't <laughs> want to put a tower up to serve a small area, and you have a small coverage gap that you want to fill, 
and you can you can run fiber, put some distributed antenna uh, systems up just to you know uh, serve a small area. Uh, but those are like the the uh, what I call the micro level. We're talking about the macro level right now. That's more of a fill-in on smaller gaps. What would you define a small area? Because I'm, I'm just thinking of our map. Yep. And I know that's... It's not as big as the the overlays that you see on the east, for instance. No, um, but I'm thinking of the beach community down yep. there. Um, yep. Because that's a fairly small over it, over right. it district. Right, right. That might be, you know, a possible uh, area. Um, where you you had a stretch of uh, uh, of roadway and beach that you know you had poles along a road that you know maybe uh, you know a half a mile or a mile of, of roadway that you could put a distributed antenna system to solve that. Okay. Get, no, um, just a minute. I will get to everybody here. Uh, Councilor Saint Clair. Yeah. Uh, were you were you finished? I just I, I want I'd like. Yeah, I guess I want okay. to see an amendment. I just want to get, I, wouldn't, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I want to get it better clarified for Thank the you. public So I appreciate that. on what, what you were discussing. Yeah, I, um, I'd like to see an amendment written up um, okay. for this to get rid of that line item. All right, you, you could present that. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, I, there's people down here. Jim, I'll get right back to you. Remember what your question is. Um, Jean Marie, next. Uh, thanks. I just have a question. It's got to do with the amendments on pages 8, actually on page 8, um, where we're adding telecommunication facilities to list of permitted uses in various uh, districts like B2, B3, BOR, Burning Hill, mixed use, and we're deleting it from Pine Point Industrial. Uh, can you talk about why we're doing that and why we aren't just leaving them as special exceptions? Um, the idea behind that is those are all commercial zones mm -hmm. where the amendments are proposing that the planning board be the review board for telecommunication facilities and commercial zones because they're already reviewing commercial buildings through site plan review. So it was... Um, it was for those reasons that we were thinking about shifting it from a zoning board review to a planning board review because the planning board's much more used to reviewing the aesthetics, the performance standards around commercial buildings, when the zoning board is um, much more accustomed to reviewing appeals and special exceptions in residential areas. So that's the distinction there. And the reason I bring it up is because uh, some of these zones allow residential in them in the way that they're zoned. Mm -hmm. um, and I know there are people, I mean, I'm kind of playing off from what Kate's saying to some degree. I mean, to be honest with you, there are people who still have, and I'm going to bring up the word health, health concerns, um, as one of their concerns with, with cell phone uh, transmission. And that's why I'm wondering if it makes sense to leave them as special exception rather than just adding them as a permitted use. The council could, I mean, that's how they're treated now. So if you think the zoning board's um, special exception criteria is more appropriate looking at telecommunication facilities, that's that's fine. This is I mean, just to allay, you know, that's that dish, additional overlay of concern. There isn't going to be like health concern standard. Oh, right, and I know. Special you, exception that's criteria. Right. That's right, and I understand that, but... Um, I'm just looking at it from a purely keeping people happy or happier point of view. So that's, my, that's just my two cents worth. It's just leave them as special exceptions. Okay. That's it. Unless someone I'll can see. convince me otherwise. Well, I think that has to do with... Can I chime in on that? Because yeah. I just want to make sure right. I understood that. What, what I heard from you is if it's permitted use, we have a higher control over it because it's the planning board process okay. versus if it's special exemption, that's a zoning board. It's a matter of... I don't know that you have a higher... It. Yeah, it's, it's, it's 
a matter of which board is reviewing the application. Um, it's not a matter of which board has is easier than the other. I mean, if the zoning board is looking at a special exception, they need to review the application and see that it meets all the special exception criteria. Um, and in that, they look at the aesthetics of the building, how it fits fits into the, the look of the building. They look at impacts on abutters, on sort of land use related matters. Um, so that's worked fine in the past. There's been a few applications and, and, the, and the zoning board did that. That's the way it's structured for all telecommunication facilities now in the ordinance. The proposal to change it was more a matter of um, directing commercial buildings that the planning board has already probably looked at in the mm -hmm. past and then has a lot of familiarity with using the design standards and their other review standards to look at commercial buildings. So it seemed like in that way the planning board um, would be a good review board, but that's not to say the zoning board couldn't provide that same role. I don't think it's a, a, a large distinction okay. there. Councilor Donovan. Dan, I, I wanted to pick up on uh, uh, Kate's uh, comment because I, I had a similar thought about setbacks, but I never really formulated uh, a good approach to it. We're talking about B2, okay. uh, page 3, B Roman, uh, two small eyes. In the middle of the paragraph, it says the planning board shall have the discretion to either increase the standard setback to 200% or decrease it to 100% of the total tower if it finds through the siting that are in a different location will better screen and buffer. Uh, would it not work to give them more, the planning board, more latitude to set a uh, a tower back from a pro property line uh, if it sees that there's a house here and a house over here, that 200% uh, uh, <coughs> of a 130-foot tower is 260 feet of the size of a football field. But the configuration of the lot would allow for a greater setback without any real interference with the uh, with the application for a tower, because it, I mean you can keep moving it back, keep it back till you're so close to the other side mm -hmm. that you you've obviously now got setback problems on the other side. But I'm thinking, wouldn't the planning board want the authority to be able to set it back? In other words, why just 200 percent? I'm I'm wondering, is there? Wouldn't it be better to just give them the kind of outright discretion to be able to cite it in a manner that would have the least impact mm -hmm. uh, with it with still main obviously you gotta still have a minimum of a hundred percent setback from each side. So there's limits on how far you can move away from the hypothetical instance of a house. Uh, but I'm not sure why the two hundred percent as a limiting factor is 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 necessary to to limit the planning board's discretion. I mean, we certainly can look at continuing to adjust the the setbacks. I mean, zoning needs to have quantitative measurements in it. So, um, I think the the more the town gets into total free reign on distance, the more likely it could be challenged. Mm -hmm. um, but there certainly can be, you know, 200% or greater. Or there can be language to work with an applicant to get them to, to do more than 200%. There does need to be some bookends at some point. Right. I think you'd have, you'd still have the 150% as the benchmark, 100% minimum. But within that, then the planning board is not limited to moving it away from a particular location just 200%, it could move it a greater distance if that was going to make the tower less of, have less of an impact, adverse impact on some mm -hmm. residential neighboring property. 
have, we can continue to look at what I, is that upper limit on percentage. So, yeah, yeah, I just think that I hadn't really come to that uh, how to deal with it, but Kate's question really raised it again in my mind. I think that's one of the nice attributes of a 25-acre threshold is there is applicant willing and board willing a lot of room to, to move the tower around um, to get an optimal location and, and to minimize impacts to abutters and views and all those things. So. Which, oh, I'm sorry. Which then brings up my question on these other districts, adding it in, I'm assuming, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, that in these other districts, like B2, B3, BOR, uh, RH, the setbacks for the towers, are they just the setbacks for these areas, or, or do these setbacks? No, those aren't. Those are telecommunications. Sorry for the confusion. There's transmission towers, which are the cell towers. Yeah. Telecommunications facilities are what are proposed to be permitted uses in those other zones. Those are only antennas attached to a building. So okay. none of these acreage and setback requirements as currently written apply. Um, the building setback applies to the neighbor right. or, you know, the regular space and bulk standards apply because the antenna is part of part of the, the structure, part of the building, or attached to it. Gotcha. I I I apologize. I'm no, I'm no, that was good. no, because I'm I <laughs> I'm confused myself no, about these things. Uh, now that I'm looking back. Where there's the difference here between the telecommunication facility and transmission tower. Right. And I, in my quick looking at it again. Um, Never mind. Yeah, but towers. We're good. Are, towers are only. <laughs> Doesn't her question uh, relate primarily to facilities, which are primarily relate to just stealth? Uh, oh yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question too. Isn't that? I mean, the facilities are with that don't have a tower can only be in stealth settings. Yeah, and the term stealth maybe wasn't used. Yeah, properly there. Yeah, there <laughs> could be, yeah. yeah. And I was getting my T's and T's. No, up. that was... <laughs> is, is yours a new question or a same, on the same subject? Um, if it's new, Jim's been waiting. That's fine. Okay. I have one last one, I think, follow yeah. up on this. And it fits back to what Ivan was talking about with this distributed antenna system. So if I understood correctly, the likelihood of and the practicality of a system like that to serve large areas of this town are probably unlikely, but there could be applications in particular in residential neighborhoods, which is a source of some concern, perhaps. Dan, would you consider this kind of DAS system a telecommunication, telecommunication facility? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And therefore, what review would it be subjected to? If it meets the definition, then it would be a, if it's a residential area, it would be a zoning board of appeals review. So I'm thinking the scenario whereby these facilities are put on existing utility poles that sit there in the neighborhoods today. So they'd, they'd seek a set, need a special exception to do so in a residential area. That's, unless there's some other levels of government that, that supersede that, then, then it would. Good, I guess I'm, I just wanted a confirmation that there was some level of review, review and approval required as opposed to the kind of slipping through the cracks that these could happen. We can, we'll check with the town attorney on it because it's, it's, it's a nuance, mm -hmm. you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a common thing um, within the community. So, I mean, to be 100% yeah, sure. There's a distinct difference, at least in my mind, between an existing structure, a building, church or commercial building, and a utility pole. Mm -hmm. Right. I think... When staff's been working on this, we've been thinking of the larger transmission um, line utility poles. So well, that, Ivan's like Ivan's description just yeah. got me thinking that there may be some actual application in this town uh, on a smaller scale. So thank you. I have to it, Jim, uh, Council Benedict, you are next, and then Council Blaise. I just have a, 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 a question that, because I don't understand. We have people in the community that have issues with cell towers, and I don't mean 
where they're placed. They have physical and mental issues with them. Uh, there are other people that their children have issues with it. I personally think it's absolutely dead wrong to put it in the steeple of a church where people attending can't even see that there's something there. And they're walking in for a service or a meeting or whatever. Exactly. And you don't know if there's, there's, there's something in the steeple of the church. At least if, there's a, if it's on a building, they could see it going in. That's something different. If they really need to avoid it, they don't have to go there. But if you put it in a steeple, no one's going to know it's there. How do we <laughs> alleviate that? I, can I comment? I just want to comment on that. First of all, um, the, they, in order to put this in a steeple, they have to get the permission from the church, which is usually a committee mm -hmm. on the church. And, I mean, if, if, if it's that strong an issue, we probably can put in this ordinance that they need to have notification at the doorways that there's cell phone, just cell phone um, equipment in the building. Mm -hmm. That's one way of solving it. Put a sign. But, um, but, but, there, but people, there those, then there are people that, what if that's their home church and now so they can't go there anymore? And we took that right away from them? No, we didn't. No, we didn't. No, they, they have a committee that, that, no, I'm that saying makes these decisions. It's posted, and we take we're we're mm -hmm. at Scarborough. We're just going to take that right away from them because we place um, a transmitter in their in their church. It doesn't have anything to do with our committee. Well, I'm just saying that the church the the church is uh, the parishioners belong the the people that that go there. Um, I don't know how to. Yeah. To explain. I mean, uh, an antenna <clears throat> couldn't go in that application without the church permitting it. Right. It would have to be a conscious decision on their part. Okay. What about the guy that comes up here from Boston? <laughs> Whose children get sick when they're near an antenna, and they have no idea, and they go in, go in the church. I just think putting it in a steeple is it, all well from aesthetics. But as a practical application, I don't think it's a good application. A lot of people don't care to share the fact that they have got something wrong with them. Most of us are like that. But I can't see anybody individually sitting in front of a board saying, well, I get these serious headaches or I get a nervous something in front of a group. I just don't see it. But I think in a, in a, in a steeple, we're not protecting these people. Or children. All right. Count, um, council Blaze? Well, on the same issue, um, I took a look at every zoning uh, area that we have in town this afternoon. We've got roughly 25 different zones in this town. Telecommunication facilities are allowed in 21 of the 25. So basically they're allowed all over the place. Mm -hmm. Which poses, and they've been allowed for years, and Lord knows how many steeples we have. But I mean, this is, this is nothing new. I, I'd like to understand if this new proposal eliminates all of that stuff and throws it back onto the planning board's responsibility of if somebody wants to put in a telecommunication facility, they've got to go to the planning board to get approval. The, the proposal that's before you changes the review for telecommunication facilities um, to the planning board if they're proposed in a commercial setting, a commercial zone. 
Okay. So, so it gives them the role in those zones, not in the residential zones. So if a wireless company goes to a church and negotiates with the church, then all they have to do is go to the, the Zoning Board of Appeals. If the church is in a residential zone, they go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. If the church is in a commercial if zone, they the go to the Planning Board. Oh, really? Wow, okay. Um, I think the Planning Board has got to be responsible for approving all telecommunication equipment, whether it be a facility or a tower. They're going to have the expertise. Um, they're going to have definitions set up as to what should be there, what shouldn't be there. Um, and I'm not too terribly certain whether we should be eliminating all special exceptions in this town for telecommunication facilities and throw it right into here and have the, the planning board approve it. Mm -hmm. Because right now, people can put them up any place. All they have to do is go to the zoning board. And what's the zoning board going to do? They're going to approve it. Um, so I do have a concern with that. I think, I think this whole area of the, the stealth, uh, DAS, whatever you want to call them, uh, the telecommunication facilities, we've got to take a, a, a closer look at that as to how we're going to handle it. We have to handle it, handle it consistently. We can't have one group handle it for one person or one area and then another group handle it for another area. I'm against that completely. Can I go on, on to another subject or? What's that again? Can I go on to another subject? Cell phone tower? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we ought to be increasing the height, uh, height limit of towers in the industrial zones to 200 feet. Uh, I've always been in favor of it. Uh, I know the wireless companies say, oh, we don't need it 200 feet. I don't see anybody building a tower in our industrial zones. Nobody. Um, we do have an industrial overlay zones which allows towers down a pine point. So I don't know why we have an overlay district down here. Just put it in the overlay zone. It's allowed down there. Any board can do their thing. Um, I think we should. I'm all right with the overlays here, the overlay area on the west side of the highway, turnpike. Uh, we've got to be careful about. I want to be sure that if a wireless company comes forward and says I've got to have it in on this particular piece of property and it's surrounded by houses, and I don't mean next to each other because over there most of the zoning is pretty much two acre zoning and stuff like that. But if it's surrounded by a whole bunch of houses and the residents come to a meeting where this is being discussed by the planning board and they are objecting to it, I think the planning board has the right, or should have the right, to refuse it. And I don't necessarily see that in here. I almost see, well, if they can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you put it on 25 acre lot, you can do it. I'm uncomfortable with that. We should be here protecting the people and then secondarily provide the people with the services that they need. And I think, if my honest opinion is all we should be doing is changing the height of towers in industrial zones and leaving it at that 
and then let the uh, cell, co uh, cell phone companies deal with it and see what they come up with, personally. Okay. Um, Ivan, I was wondering, can you speak to the uh, issue of the 200-foot tower and in industrial zones and how that relates to um, putting towers in other locations that are shorter? Sure. Um, <clears throat> when we uh, did our analysis, we looked uh, um, at existing structures that you had uh, already in town, um, and we looked at increasing that that height uh, to see what that would do uh, in the areas where you don't have coverage. And in the cellular world, it's a balancing act. Um, it's different from the way, uh, for instance, radio paging used to be 15, 20 years ago, where they had one-way communication to a pager, and you wanted to get an antenna as high as possible to, to communicate to as many people as possible. In the cellular world, it's all about creating sites and sectors. It's even, it's, it's more than just a site, because each site has sectors. There's three sectors. And you're targeting population within, within each sector. And the sites interact with one another. They hand off. As you're driving down the road, you don't realize it, but your phone is connecting to sites as you travel down the road. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is because the large influx of, of cellular users over the years uh, has necessitated additional sites. So if you take a site and you increase it in height, you have the potential problem of communicating too far and possibly getting too many users onto a sector, which would potentially busy out a sector. Hmm. The two things the cell companies don't want is no coverage or a drop call because there's no, there's no uh, space for another user to make a phone call, for instance. So in the cellular world, it's a balancing act. We, we want to have coverage. We want to have enough coverage into a geographical area. But then we want to be able to hand off to the next site, uh, to that next geographical area. In your industrial zones where they're, where they're located, I can tell you that you know, we looked at raising the height just because I, you know, we, we heard it was a concern here um, or a, a question about going up to 200 feet, that still does not solve from a coverage problem your areas where you have gaps. That's the first thing. Secondly, even if it did solve some of these, these coverage gaps uh, in town, the carriers potentially could have problems with capacity or interfering with additional sites uh, that they have adjoining sites. If you, if, you, if, if you take a look at cell sites and you look at antennas, the, the panel antennas that are on, on a pole, a lot of times you see the, the antennas are not vertically straight up and down. Right. They're, they're tilted. There's actually two types of, of um, mechanisms for this tilt. There's a mechanical tilt, which you can visually see it, and then there's what's called electronic tilt, which they can direct the radio waves downward because they're trying, again, target an area where they want coverage. The problem in, in the RF world is it's not a perfect science. I can't say, here, I want radio coverage right here, and I want it to stop. Just like you know, municipalities, I, I hear time and time again, well, I, you know, I just want the coverage to cover our town. I don't care about the other town. Well, you can't control that. You can't stop it at the town border and say, you know, there's not going to be any coverage across the border. So what you'll see is sometimes, uh, especially sites that are on, on uh, hilly terrain, um, 
you you have antennas that you know have noticeable down tilt because they don't want to shoot out towards the horizon. If you if you have a uh, height above average terrain that's 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 pretty high, uh, you you don't want to pick up users six miles away, for instance. That's going to hurt your capacity on that site when you're trying to talk to people that are a mile or two miles from the site. Does that help? That's great. I think so. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. I understand mm -hmm. that the, you know, a two and a half foot tower is going to reach out 12, 15 miles or whatever it is. But also, when, when you're talking about the tilting of the transmitters, it seems to me that if you can tilt the transmitters, you can, and have a series of them tilted at different angles, you're serving a whole bunch of different areas, mm. right? Well, not. I'm not concerned necessarily. Yeah, no, up. you're you're absolutely right, and that's you know in the, in the case where you have a high, you know, like uh, uh, you know, on top of, for instance, a ski ski area, you know, you you want to have that down tilt because you're trying to concentrate in an area. Uh, uh, closer to, to the to the mountain versus propagating out further. The problem is that you can't get by the physics of it. Okay, meaning that I can tilt all I want, but when I get a distance of X from this antenna, I lose signal strength. Right. Okay, I can't get I can't get past that. Physics are what they are. The higher the frequency, the more loss in free space. So I could have a tower uh, uh, eight miles away that, that's, that's really high, and they tilt their antennas down towards me, but they're using the you know, PCS range at 1,900 megahertz. It's not going to matter because the signal strength, by the time it, it, it hits my mobile phone, is too weak. Mm -hmm. It's just it's physics. Yeah, understand that the cell companies, they started out at the lower frequency bands at 800 megahertz. The recent auctions in 1996, they got frequencies at the 1900 megahertz range. There's a drastic difference between those two frequency bands. There's a tremendous amount more loss at the 1900 megahertz range. Just if I could point out on that point, the industrial zone, uh, south gate and such, off, you know, close to the marsh, at the head of the marsh, if I'm not mistaken, it's kind of in the shadow of the Scotto Hill Tower, uh, and let's face it, it's almost at sea level. So it's not much. I don't need to be a physicist to understand why we don't have a tower there. It's not likely to be a good site now or in the future. Is that right? Well, yeah. Good? Especially the foliage is the big killer at the higher frequency range. Um, the, the signals. When you get above a thousand megahertz, they're more line of sight. They don't bend. They don't, you know, gently roll over the hills and and uh, and propagate. Are, are the are the higher frequencies more for data transmission and internet service? No, no. They they're uh, the carriers allocate bandwidth um, for data and voice in all of their licensed bands, and carriers will have licensed uh, frequencies both in the, the lower frequency bands and they'll have them in the higher frequency bands. And you've probably heard of 700 megahertz is a new band that was auctioned. Uh, there's more bandwidth, and that's mainly because it's, it's for higher speed, more data. But they still have to have that voice component. So they, they do both in, in the bands, both uh, voice and data. How come? How come we have a map like this yep. that shows a lot of weakness out on the western side of town and some weakness along the, the coast? And if I go to every major wireless website and ask for my coverage for the town of Scarborough, it's pretty decent. Now I'll tell I'll tell you why. <laughs> Somebody's lying, right? But, no, when I worked when I worked many moons ago at Motorola in the engineering side, we had a sales and marketing side. <laughs> and when I created maps for these guys 
to go out and sell commercial service, uh, two-way radio service, okay, you'd be surprised <laughs> how many times those maps would change a little bit, you know, to show better coverage. Right. The sales and marketing side is concerned about, so if I'm from AT&T, my coverage is better than Verizon. That's disturbing and to me. That's disturbing. It's Way it is. The engineering side is the proof in the is in the pudding. Okay, that on the engineering side, they when when, when they design networks and they design their next phase of build outs and and high speed 4G. Okay, um, they they designed a certain minimum criteria. All right, so that's yeah. Jim, has it had to do with the subject? Yes, sir. Okay. I just have a question that's uh, a little far out, but really not. Do you feel that in any certain amount of time in the near future, cell phones and data will be coming off of satellites? Satellites, yeah. yeah. I get that question a lot. Um, there is a role for satellite communication, okay? Uh, and where you see that role is in countries where the infrastructure is poor to begin with. Right. All right. Uh, and where, what I mean by that is, in, in this country, we had a lot of technological advances with the the, uh, the phone systems, you know, the, the, the from Bell Atlantic all the way up on infrastructure. Okay, and getting high speed data and interconnection and fiber, et cetera, et cetera. In countries that don't have that, you'll see that satellite communication is, is uh, extremely valuable because they don't have infrastructure to connect and transport the signals. Because every time you go through a cell site, it ultimately goes back to a master switch location. And those switch locations are connected. We have the infrastructure in this country that is, is pretty good to support all that. You'll find that in, in other countries where they don't have that infrastructure, cellular has even uh, progressed to the point where it's overtaken regular telephone. Everybody has a phone. If you go to the Middle East, for instance, they, they've built out cellular, interconnected those cell sites via microwave, et cetera, and, and high speed, so that that is more reliable than the telephone system in the country. In this country, it's, it's the opposite. So satellite communication uh, is still not a price point. It's not, it's not where cell phone price points are. There's too much infrastructure that's been invested in this country for it to all of a sudden go away. Do you feel that at some point it will? I don't, I don't see it going away. I can tell you, I don't see it going away in the next 30 years. Because That's what they, I wanted to hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> okay. Um, Good point. <laughs> any more questions on the height of cell phone towers? Mm -hmm. Jessica, you were next. Councilor Holbrook. So, well, I don't know that I particularly have questions for you, but I have some questions. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go back through some notes because I was listening to everybody else kind of talk a little bit first. Um, is there any kind of preferential treatment or a priority that's geared towards, you know, asking the cell phone companies if they've come to the level in the steps of, you know, they want to try to increase their coverage or whatever, and, I mean, we directing them at all to fill some of our bigger gaps first? rather than, you know, expanding in, you know, an area that's only going to maybe help service 20 people versus an area that's going to help service a couple hundred. And, you know, th there's certainly areas that are having, you know, West Scarborough, I guess, I I'm being biased here for a second, so <laughs> let, let, me, let me put it to you this way. I'm more concerned about priority being in these white areas. These are the areas where you're driving down the road and you might not get emergency service that's on right. the phone. Right. Um, right. So how can we kind of maybe direct that a little bit that if you've come to the point you're going to build a tower, it needs to be 
addressing these areas first? And can we do that? Sure. Uh, one thing that's been done in other municipalities um, is that when when towns identify overlay areas, they'll look at municipal land within those overlay uh, overlay districts, and they will go out for RFP on the street to say, "Hey, we're looking for coverage here." And they go to all the carriers, the tower companies, and say, "Hey, we want proposals." So what you're doing is you're trying to stimulate interest with the carriers to say, hey, look at us. Mm -hmm. Because what's important with the carriers, they, they look out, um, you know, f for instance, next year's planning is probably already figured out. Mm -hmm. They already know where they're targeting um, and what towns they're going to be going in front of. It, so you have, it, it's, it's a long process. You have to get into that queue, if you will, um, but it's also driven by their call statistics. Every site monitors how many calls go through it, mm. how many calls were dropped potentially, uh, how many calls were blocked, the capacity, um, and that gives them an idea on the sales and marketing side, hey, we've got users in this area, the number is growing, we need to do something. I should enable that option on my phone. Right. Totally oh, okay. That and, and, and customer complaints. <laughs> Good to know. Customer complaints. You know, uh, people picking up the phone saying, hey, there's no service here, there's no service here. It gets them thinking about right. Scarborough. You've got to get Scarborough <clears throat> on their radar screen. Okay. So um, something that was one of the tools that I guess we're, we're going to have, um, and just for curiosity's sake, what is a balloon test? Me too. I can see a hot air balloon. Yeah, and it, you know, a big balloon yeah. is yeah. helium's put in it, and yeah. they put it up at the height of the top of the tower to see give see the planning board, the public, whoever's participating in the review okay. process, it's like an on-site real life visual as to okay, where is that going to be on the horizon? Where are the views going to be of it, and where aren't they going to be of it to help hmm. the board make some judgments on? What should the setback be? What should the buffering be? Where should the tower go on the site? Okay. So it's another way to really... In, a, in, a, in addition, they'll take that and do photo simulations where you can, and I don't know if it was in there, but you can, you can ask them to take pictures from different geographical areas um, around town mm -hmm. of the balloon, and then they can take that and superimpose a tower onto that photo. Okay. Um, and I'm, I have another question pertaining to the lots after the fact, and, and this might just be because I don't do math in my head. Um, <laughs> why, why is the decision on, um, so after, let's say, a tower gets built on a 25-acre parcel, um, because the underlying zoning is an RF two-acre, why, why is it proposed as five for the tower? To accommodate a 150 to 200 setback. percent setback of the tower height and to also maintain a critical mass of, of vegetation and, and natural area around the tower um, because, you know, these standards are really driven on vegetation. distance from abutters so that these towers are screened. So if they go in and then the site is totally cleared for development or for other uses a year later that, you know, kind of is going against the intent of all the work the planning board did. So this five acres was felt that that gives the landowner uh, a fair amount of land, 20 plus acres to, to use in the future, um, while also maintaining a critical mass of land around the town. So that would be, you know, on that higher end, that 200% setback to kind yeah. of... Yeah, depending on the level. tower height, but, yeah. Okay. Um, I did want to maybe differently piggyback on a thought about having more flexibility in that 25-acre parcel. Um, the setback is just how far you can be from your property line, and, and I 
you know, geography comes to mind on some of these locations, and you know, certainly there are probably instances where you want to be. I'm wondering if it's a matter of the verbiage in it in itself. I, I don't know if that's a deletion or a subtraction, but somehow of the discretion of the planning board, I, I think might need to come into play a little bit mm -hmm. because, like I said, geography alone on some of these sites, especially, you know, I think of places in my area, you've got a lot of hilly terrain and then lower, you know, valley kind of stuff and, and then, you know, if, if, for instance, you go out Broad Turn Road, you're mm -hmm. going to come down and you've got a hundred foot hill on this side of you and then none such cuts down over and that's your 25 acres. So, you know, geography might need to come into play a little bit about, you know, maybe this is the best we can do. You know, maybe it's like you said. You, you might meet the 250 on this property line, but you might only be 100 on that property line. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a little more wiggle room and, and how to, the placement might go. Okay. Um, because, again, to, to meet your setbacks, I'd be concerned about a subpar place in the placement because that makes our setback requirement but really the top of the hill, which cuts you short on your setback, is a better location for it because you're going to broadcast better. Um, and I know ledge and all those lovely yeah. things come into yeah. play and clay and <coughs> wetlands and cat nine tails and wonderful things. Um, I already asked that one. Oh, area sub, I already asked that one or somebody else did. Um, I could be supportive of the signage on the buildings concept. Um, for the stealth applications, I think that's a, a really good idea. I certainly think it probably could be a requirement. Um, you know, it it kind of defeats the purpose of not having stealth if, you know, if the concern is aesthetic, the stealth takes care of that. Right. You, you know, so, um, but it certainly could be very supportive of a signage program so that the public is aware, you know, the general person coming onto the premises is aware that that there's some kind of something on site. Um, you know, that could be a really nice, you know, themed kind of, you know, it's the same general sign at each location. So, again, I'm big on signage being repetitive. It's one of those second nature things. You don't have to actually read it to know what the sign says. So, simple, basic, one color, whatever. Um, but I, I could be very supportive of that. Um, all sun towers use. Oh, um, I, I agree with the concept of anything to do with cell phone tower facility, the, the, the whole, no matter whether it's little hubbub pieces that you're puddle jumping from power lines to actual, you know, in, you know, tower, towers themselves. Yeah, I, I agree with the concept. It really all needs to be planning board. It, one identity of, of our, you know, branches needs to be heading this up so that they're more aware. When, when you have it split between the different committees, it is. It's a nightmare because this one doesn't know what that one did, and you know, for mm -hmm. continuity purposes, I, I agree with that. Um, the other last kind of question I had had to do with um, you did touch base about something to do with the installation of power facilities on power lines, and I'm wondering if. What kind of power line are, are we, we talking about as far as, for instance, again, I'm, I'm picturing West Scarborough has those kind of typical high voltage lines that run through on that, that back corner up there um, in North Scarborough, actually. Um, is this a use that was considered as far as, you know, maybe being able to put something on there versus a tower out in that area? And again, yeah. pre preferential treatment too. We'd rather see you do this first, and then, you know, right. building a tower. Yeah, that was the intent. Um, one of the intents behind putting the telecommunication facility the um, as the the third priority before putting in a new tower in the overlay area for that kind of situation where there's existing tall structures really such as well buffered to begin poles with, so that yeah. there are buffered and they're also not that great looking. Uh -huh. So um, what's another, from an aesthetic plan standpoint, what's another few antennas on them? It, it's probably not going to be noticeable as opposed to a new tower on a 25 acre parcel nearby. Um, so that was the reason it was. But that will fall under the you need to look there 
first. That, that would okay. that would qualify, and that was one of the intents. The the more distribution utility poles, the typical CMP poles in town for the for the DAS system, we weren't intending that would be mm -hmm. a big player in the community. That wasn't one of the focuses. Just thinking that we don't have the population density and the, yeah. the demand for it. But if there are a few applications where that makes sense, we need to look closer to mm. at that to make sure it's a planning board review or you know a, a town review. Uh, thing, not just a by right installation. So we need to look at that. And I'm just reading through some other quick notes real quick. Something got answered. Can, you, can I ask somebody a else question about that? Go ahead. Since she's done. Well, I might come back to me. I'm reading through my notes. <laughs> okay, well, um, Councilor Donovan's been waiting. So go ahead. Uh, a sim simple one, uh, Ivan. Uh, I know there is a vertical separation mm -hmm. uh, of 10 feet called yes. for. Yes. Uh, is that subject to it? How is that standard set? Is that is that somehow written in stone, or are some places having five foot separations? Uh, no. What we see um, is 10 foot minimum uh, in in the industry, and that's just so that there's uh, there's no interaction between the cell companies' so we can't uh, equipment. Really we can't stretch that. There's no. No, I no, not. Nothing there. For no, okay. no. Uh, the other thing I wanted to pick up on was, as Ed, you picked up on, and Jeff, you picked up on, uh, this idea that we've got uh, some quantitative or objective standards for the planning board, but we don't really uh, haven't really attempted any qualitative or subjective standards for the planning board. And, I, and I'm, I'm thinking of the visual impact section. When you, when you read it, and Dan and I have talked about this, and I, I'm, I don't have a, a real good solution, but I, it ties into what Ed was saying, which was, you know, if, uh, if they beat all the criteria, uh, is the planning board obligated to pass it, even though there's some people over here who are justifiably howling about the inappropriateness of it? Well, I was thinking about it more in the context of the visual impact, because I think the planning board probably, you know, they, uh, it's maybe or maybe not, uh, if people are howling, uh, they, they're, they're justified. But certainly, we've heard a lot about protecting the visual corridors. And when you read the visual impact section, what you see is that they, ha this is page four at the bottom, D. What we've given the planning board is some powers to uh, identify if there's a problem, but we haven't given them any specific powers to correct it other than the objective quantitative tests, which are You've got to have a certain setback. You've got to have a certain size of lot. Uh, you you can't take away uh, uh, dense foliage that's grown up or around uh, the proposed tower. Uh, but there is nothing there that gives the planning board any kind. You know, this is sort of that unintentional consequence one, where we're, we've tried constantly to cut back on having an unintentional consequence. And I think the overlay district does a great job of, of really starting to, so we start, it's like baby steps. We're taking a, this is a much smaller step than maybe we had originally contemplated we were gonna take. And I am full support of that. I think we should be better to be a little too tight this go around, because I wouldn't mind revisiting this if we learned that we, we needed to, to make some corrections. It wouldn't bother me one bit, but for the, the visual, I'm worried that uh, we haven't given the planning board any additional discretion to protect other than you meet the requirements of 25 acres, you meet the requirements of the setback, you meet the requirement of not cutting down any trees. Well, what if they get to the end of the list <laughs> and it's still a pretty substantial uh, interference with the visual impact because uh, that's, that's a real important part of Scarborough's appeal to people is that it has some great vista views. So uh, 
I don't know if we can come up with anything that would be appropriate that because the problem with sub uh, qualitative is it is subjective <laughs> it's in the eyes of the beholder whether it's a problem or not uh, and uh, and people can vary greatly so I'm I, I don't have a solution but I just I express it as a worry that we haven't really tried we haven't been able to come up with enough discretion in the planning board to make sure that that application that comes forward doesn't have us go, Jesus, that was that was too bad. We didn't have a rule to cover that. That's 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 that was one of the things that's been gnawing at me, but I haven't been able to come up with anything to suggest a solution. You don't think the last sentence goes to that a little bit? Planning board may also require other Simulations of the tower height and location within the landscape using a balloon test or similar. I method. think that gives them the power to uh, ask for other ways in which to have the problem depicted. Yeah. I don't think it gives them the power to say, well, now that you've depicted it and we've looked at it and we don't like it, we don't have any discretion or any rule <laughs> to say, therefore, we're not going to allow it. That's that's. That's the part. So I just throw it out there because I'm I'm sensitive to what you said and what Jessica said about about having the discretion to deal with those unfortunate circumstances that we don't want to be faced with or we don't want to present the town with. Right. Um, can, I, can I just make a comment on that? Um, I spoke with Alan Paul earlier this week about this ordinance and one of the things that I know that he wants to do is he wants to set up a workshop with his own, uh, with the planning board to not only digest this but to set a whole bunch of different standards whereby they would go through and analyze all these applications. Uh, things that we, would, we normally wouldn't put in, into an ordinance but they would have. Um, and I think one of the most important things about this thing is this has got to go back to the planning board for their review. And they've got to come back to us with an opinion on it. And at the same time, when they do, they'll come back and say, well, we can do it, and this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be asking this question and that question and that question. I think we have to leave it up to the planning board to do that, Bill. Uh, I don't think that we can write all of that into into an ordinance, uh, and I have all the confidence in the world <laughs> that they're going to do it, and they'll do it quick. I can comment on that because I've been in constant contact with um, Alan Paul, and um, we have a communication from Susan Auglis. Um, they, they've looked over this. Um, you know, what we have here in front of us um, with the proposed amendments. And they told me, oh, well, in a recent conversation with Alan Paul today, um, that they had enough, they had enough tools here to work with. They want, they want the time to have that workshop and have a plan of procedure on how they're going to take and, and apply this. Right. So, and my idea that I floated to to them was if if passed, if it even passes, um, that um, that I would offer the amendment to uh, postpone the starting date and give them uh, 30 days. And I asked them if that would work, and they said yes. Um, that would give them the meeting of the 27th and a following meeting if they needed to um, get everything together yeah, um, so that they're ready to receive applications. That that's what, that was the communications I had with him. They didn't need to, uh, they said they no longer thought they had the need to wait. Just need time to organize. That was the discussion I had with them. Well. Pretty much what I said, I yeah, think. Right. right. 
Right. So we're going to give them, we're going to give them the time because I'm going to I just ask that um, that the proper amendment be drafted by staff for to be presented um, for the the start you know a later start date. What's that? Yeah. I, no, I, I I'm, I'm just I'm yeah. just I'm just a little bit concerned about why it's so important that we're pushing this thing. Why are we pushing it so quickly? Okay, I can answer that for you right now. Um, it's not it's not so much as the push um, at all. We've been working on this for a long time, yeah. and um, the, we're we're looking at a uh, there could be three new counselors. So you're going to be back to zero again. There's going to be all the council is going to need to be brought up to uh, you know up to uh, speed up to speed on wh what what we've done. There's a lot. This you know people sitting here right now um, know what they've formulated, how they formulated, why they formulated it, the uh, input from each and every one of us here that's gone into this. We all understand that right now. We wait in uh, to a vote in November. It's you know it's gonna. Who knows how many? If, whether it's gonna be the same council or not. So there's you know it, it's not meant to be rushed. It's I mean we've been working on it. So, well I don't know, 16 yeah. months is it? Well, let's 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 be honest about the 16 months. We've been working on it. For about two months. Mm. Well, maybe. Uh, but I, I don't, really, we've I don't been working really on it for two that. months, mm. and the Stay first proposal was totally out to lunch, and now we have this. Mm. You have to have a starting point. Now. I understand that, but let's not talk about 16 months. We've been working on it for 16 months. Can I ask okay. a real quick question? Well, there was plenty of time for other councils to weigh in on the ordinance as it was being formulated. Um, Yes, I, I'll recognize Council Saint Clair. Um, just for I'm in or Dan, is there any chance that you know we're we're obviously beating this and we want to make it right and stuff that you know at the end of this somebody's cell phone tower and people go, do you later. We don't want anything to do with you. I mean, is that a possibility that they get? I'm just putting it out there. <coughs> I'm just curious. I mean. I don't know what, how, I mean, I know there's a need here, <clears throat> but I'm... You're talking about the wireless industry wanting yeah. to move on? Yeah, I just, I, I just was thinking about it and realizing, <coughs> I mean, we, we've we had Verizon Wireless coming to our ordinance meetings for, for a year, um, plus, um, before, might have been before my time, but, um, you know, I mean, they've been through this process with us, and I'm just thinking, you know, we're... We're really fine -tun tuning this, and I just didn't know if maybe some of them might get to this. If you've seen that before, where they're like, you know what, we don't want to deal with Scarborough right now. No, I think they're waiting for the town to, you know, formulate the regulations that we think are appropriate for regulating um, new installations <coughs> and. and <coughs> Recently pre presented you with you know additional responses that right. had been kind of trickling in in a, a more um, coherent yeah. package and kind of to Jessica's question earlier I mean they circled broadly on a map um, yeah. the various sites that they would likely act on the next few years I don't think there's <coughs> any guarantee that it's going to be next month or next year for some of the sites but I right. expect that once the town decides what it wants for coverage improvements and where that they'll act on a few of them. Okay. Um, so. Thank you. Council Holbrook. Um, I was just curious if, if we could request, I, I know you said you're going to send it to the planning board to have an opportunity to have two months, uh, not two months, two meetings with, with that. Um, if we could request that they send back um, feedback and recommendations. Mm -hmm. yep. um, Okay, because um, what um, I think we've gone over this pretty good. Yeah. Anybody's got any last thing? Because I want to move on. It's um, approaching nine o'clock, okay. and like I said, something new on um, workshop. 
since we don't have a meeting directly after this, um, anybody from the public um, that's here tonight that have comments or questions <coughs> of staff may approach the podium tonight and ask their questions or make their comments. So I have a question about, I guess, one of the first questions I have is, um, what are the notification requirements for these proposed amendments? In other words, um, when an applicant comes in, I suppose it depends on if it goes to the Planning Board or the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, the Zoning Board of Appeals criteria could also be incorporated in the Planning Board's criteria and or there are applications where you have to go to the zoning board and the planning board. And so I know you guys were talking about that a little bit. Um, but what I don't know is what the notification requirements as far as abutters are concerned. And um, when it comes to these particular towers, um, since uh, the radio frequency radiation actually extends out over, you know, um, a great distance. I wondered what, and also because of aesthetics and because within a uh, half a mile to a mile of a cell tower, property values are known to go down. Uh, they're known to go down within a half mile, um, and some say up to a mile. Um, whether you could include uh, a requirement to notify all people within a half a mile to a mile before one of these towers. I, I don't know what the current one is, and I don't know if that's something you would consider. So I don't know if that's a question for Dan or... Zoning, the zoning board notification are abutters and a property owners across the street from the property, which are considered abutters. The planning board site plan review doesn't have a notification. So that's something that would need to be added for this process considering planning boards using site plan review and then these standards um, as part of their review process. So zoning board of appeals doesn't require, uh, zoning board does require a butter notification, but, but planning, planning board, board does, does not. not. Okay. And I would consider that there's no nowhere else in town um, or no other rules in town where, or other situations where a butter is in a Huge, from a huge distance, 500 feet, except for maybe contract zoning, where people within 500 feet of the contract zone are notified. So I, maybe that's something that the counselor could, could consider is looking at the notification requirements, uh, because it does affect our, our property values. Um, and then I guess this question would be for, for I, Ivan. Um, so I have a theory. I just called my husband. Um, the the um, we're located in the white zone, mm -hmm. and my husband only uses his cell phone, mostly in the basement mm -hmm. of our small ranch house. And his phone, I asked him today, he never drops a call, ever. And I'm in the white zone. <clears throat> I'm in the white zone of the Proud Snack area, just so you know. Now I have a smartphone. My calls drop sometimes, right. not too often. I keep my phone off when I don't use it because I don't. I I'm concerned about it, so I keep it off. But when I do use it, sometimes it drops. But then it picks back up. I get internet on the on the um, on Ferry Beach because I looked up the piping plovers when I was monitoring to make sure to see if I was identifying them properly. So I get internet right on the beach, Scarborough Beach, Ferry uh, Ferry Beach. So the question I have to I understand that um, Ivan said that it's really the marketing maps versus these maps, but I've got to be honest with you. I don't believe these maps are accurate, and I want to know how Ivan came up with I want to know the technical uh, way that Ivan and IDK get this map, and I want to know how that compares to with how the marketing maps 
are, because I have copies of all of those, and they're all good, sufficient. Um, there's only one little area of fair. So that's a question for Ivan. How did you, how, what is the technical way that you got these maps? And how did you, and why, what would you explain, how could you explain that I'm in a white zone and every day my husband uses um, um, his flip phone and doesn't get, because I think I know part of the answer actually, um, and doesn't get drop calls at all? Well, there's a lot of variables that go into it. Um, no. The maps are generated using computer modeling. That is the PCS frequency range, okay? Um, there are carriers, uh, as I indicated before, that use both the lower frequency range and the PCS range. Um, not knowing what service you're on or uh, what the potential for the frequency band is, that map at one of the other bands is going to look different, okay? But the trend going forward and the planning going forward, not doing something that is a one or two year lookout, I'm looking at a long term plan for Scarborough, higher speed data is coming, mm -hmm. with higher speed data requires more signal strength, mm -hmm. okay? more users at the PCS range, the 1900 megahertz range, versus the 800 megahertz range. So this is not, I would be short-sighted if I just did an 800 megahertz study and said, here you go, Scarborough, you're all set. I guess my question is, do the smartphones use the 1900 or the 1800, 1900, 800, and do the flip phones use a different? It depends, on the, it depends on the carrier, okay? And a lot of the smartphones will utilize both bands. They're, they're dual band phones, okay? And, and, and that's, and, yeah. All right. Um, but what's happening now is because of the amount of users, carriers need to offload users onto the PCS bands because the 800 bands, they don't have the bandwidth that they have at the PCS. PCS was designed for more personal communication services, internet, data, et cetera, et cetera, higher speed. Okay, so, but isn't it true, though, that this original discussion at the council level talked about phones for safety? We, we weren't necessarily talking about phones, at least that's what I heard the council say. Uh, other counselors can correct me on that, but that's what I'll I I'll correct you on that, because yes. I've been talking about, yes, uh, I need, fine. not only is it a safety issue, it's an economic development issue for people who are using data plans. Yes. Yeah. And like for example, as a realtor, I'm using, you know, my mini iPad with clients oh, yeah. at their homes and they may not have Wi Fi for example. So having a data plan available in my car, so to speak, or where I'm working, anywhere I'm working is invaluable. Yeah. Uh, you you're the one counselor that I, I did hear say that. That's correct. <laughs> And, and but it is a yeah, and it is a safety issue too. No, I, I, I also heard that, some other counselors. It, it doesn't matter. I, my point, my point, or my question to Ivan was, in general, is that is what is sufficient for what you know um, what we need. What you guys have heard was that we don't want them in residential zones, and you definitely did a good job of eliminating them from a lot of different uh, zones. This new proposal is a lot different. Um, but I still have a lot of major concerns um, about it, and I also think that I really get good coverage. And um, I do know that there are some people in business that don't, but you have the option of getting hardwired. Um, you can use hardwired phones. Now, um, some businesses may not, but that is not what government is about. Government is not supposed to be servicing to improve, um, you know, everybody's, cell phone coverage. It's not, a, it's not one of those human rights that you swear to uphold. Um, Can I what I'm saying is, Can wait, I? I'm saying that there are costs, yeah. there are costs and there are benefits. Right. And so you want to receive a certain benefit yeah. and then there are costs. Now what are the costs? I believe there are certain costs um, in terms of aesthetics and in terms of those kinds of things. And then there are benefits that the town wants to, wants to receive. Um, but 
Um, I'm, get, I'm getting off of actually what my question was. So, my um, this, I'm not. I want to ask questions. I don't want to get in the debate. Okay. That's, that's, that's right. Okay. That's right. I really want to ask questions. Can, can you bring I this know, up, Dan? I know she's asking a question, but I didn't quite catch all of. I think I missed it a little bit, so I, I just wanted to go back to it for a minute because I hadn't heard that earlier in the meeting. Uh, you had mentioned that the megahertz, which is, you know, this is great for me, so bear with me a little bit. Um, some phones are functioning fine now, some are. It depends on what megahertz level you're on. But I think you, what you said, and I just that's what I'm trying to verify, is that the predicted future is that where those phones are operating in those megahertz is going to likely change. What it is is, you know, what, what are you seeing in the phone market? You're seeing okay. flip phones to now tablets. You're seeing bigger phones, more applications. That's it's dri That's what's driving it. Okay, that you're seeing these phones that have more capabilities than what they did ten years ago. Ten years from now, even more capabilities. You know, video on demand. Um, you know, one market that. Is, is 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 going to be huge in the 4G market is the gaming market for kids mm. that are going to be mobile being able to use tablets etc at high speed. So I, I guess my other question, kind of stemming off from that, is so let's say we did nothing. Yep. And their frequencies and megahertz yep. are changing. Yep. Is the service going to become worse if we're not coming in line with? Well, what's going to happen is if you if, if you didn't have any more structures, okay, then your, in essence, your capabilities of a smartphone or a tablet are going to be limited as to what you can do. You know what kind of access you're going to have, and you know just to make one other point, I applaud what this council is doing because. If very few municipalities are proactive and they're more reactive. Change is going to come, whether you like it or not. If you're proactive, you can actually help steer the way you, you know, you'd like to see things in your town. So I applaud the fact that the, the council is doing that. Okay, okay so, so one of the just other a minute. The question. Uh, yeah. You can't. I mean, you can ask another question, but we can't have you stand up there for five, ten minutes asking questions. So. I'm so it's just a three-minute, no, it's not really no, a discussion no, then? Ask, no, it's not one more. It's not a no, it's not. Use the opportunity. <clears throat> I think my questions were very good, and I think other counselors thought they were as well. Um, I didn't say that. So um, the, I don't have my reading glasses here. One of the overlays that you have, the overlay in the area that I live, actually, is mm -hmm. over at Spurwink and Black Point Road. And um, if you have your packet, or I don't know if you all have this map, you can probably see it, the one with the red on it. Yes, of course I do. Okay, yeah. it, goes over, it goes over to Marion Jordan Road. So looking up at the map here, Marion Jordan Road is right here. And I counted within a half a mile of Marion Jordan Road at least 70 houses. It's not as dense as Higgins Beach. It's not as dense as Pleasant Hill, but there are 70, at least 70 homes. There's the um, one off of, um, I can't read these words, Marion Jordan, but there's the subdivision behind me at Kingfisher and the houses behind me. There's Kirkwood Road subdivision. Um, then there's two across the street um, near Camp Ketcha, and there's about 70 houses. So it is a residential area, and I would suggest that if you are going to, if you were trying to avoid that and you still wanted that, that you move that zone away from, you know, past Kirkwood Road where all the sub, where most of the subdivisions are. I, you know, still those people in there aren't necessarily going to want them either down by the neck, but I'm just, I'm just pointing out that I think 70 houses is a, res, is a pretty big residential area. Wouldn't you guys, I mean, do you know what I mean? <laughs> Don't you agree? I don't think that's like a non-residential area. And then likewise, if you look over at Pine Point, and I'm not there, but that whole one right there behind Pine Point, look at the huge subdivision that's right next to it. <clears throat> so just FYI, it, you know, it's not in a, 
residential neighborhood per se, but it is adjacent to those homes. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, I had other questions, but I don't think we don't Anyone else have any questions or comments that they'd like to approach the podium with? Good evening. I just have a quick question and a couple of comments. Uh, for one question for Ivan. You talked briefly, there was some interest by the council to have 200 foot towers maybe in uh, industrial zones. And the question I have is how many calls theoretically can a 200 foot tower in an industrial zone here in town handle at one time versus let's say a 150 foot tower or a 100 foot tower? Is it exponential and can we get a reality check on a 200 foot tower? How many calls can be handled and how many calls generally would be made within the proximity of here in Scarborough at any one time? Yeah, it, I can't give you a number. Um, it's, it's, it's based upon coverage. Uh, if you get more coverage at 200 feet versus 150 in areas where there are people, then you will get more calls attempting to use that site. Whether or not the call will go through depends upon how many people are using it at the same time. Right, and I, guess, and, and I think this is pretty important because I know there's some interest to have higher towers in that zone, mm -hmm. and I think it does t potentially make some sense is whether a 200-foot tower can, and there's got to be data available, whether 15,000 calls at the same time using that tower, bouncing off that tower, can be handled, which is probably more than adequate for the town of Scarborough in any particular location where that might be located versus a 150-foot tower, maybe it's 8,000 calls or a 100-foot tower that's 5,000 calls that can be handled. I think that kind of data is specific data. Right. Step up close to the mic. I don't think you're getting picked up your question. Oh, I'm sorry. So continue. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I was just wondering, you know, I think it's pretty important data to find out whether at, a, at 200 feet maybe 16,000 calls can be handled in Scarborough, and whether that's more than enough to handle the normal capacity, or whether at 150 feet, 8,000 calls can be handled, and whether that covers a two-mile area, a three-mile area, and whether that is more than adequate to handle calls coming in on a routine day here in Scarborough. I think that's pretty important data that can make it easier to, to make some of these decisions, whether it's worth looking to 200 feet in industrial zones, whether it's worth, you know, staying at 100 or, or 150 or whether it makes any difference at all, but it's got to make some kind of difference. Well, yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head when you said coverage because if going from 150 to 200 doesn't give you substantially more coverage, then it doesn't matter about capacity because if it's not reaching more people, you won't have more calls go through it. So it's, it's, it's twofold. It's both... Uh, a coverage and a capacity uh, issue. Is it possible to get some data, that kind of data, that might help the council make a, a, a decision on? Yeah, I mean, you can, you can you can look at the the differences in the industrial area at 100 feet versus 200 feet. You can see, you know, how much more coverage is afforded uh, doing that. You know. Okay. But, sir, before you sit down, could I get your uh, name yeah, for I'm the sorry. record it, and address, please? Yeah, it's Ron Bono. It's at 6 yeah. Old Neck Road. Okay, thanks. Did you have something? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just a couple of comments. I think the council raised some great questions this evening. I think there's some issues that are certainly still out there. I think the issue of, um, of um, um, setbacks in these um, uh, overlay zones and so forth, very valid uh, uh, concerns. I did hear uh, somebody mention that, um, you know, yes, we can have minimum setbacks in these overlay zones, but ultimately, uh, assuming that the uh, applicant is willing, that type of thing. And when I hear that word, it's like, okay, if the applicant's not willing, then if we have a, a minimum of 100 feet or 100 percent of the tower height or 200 percent or whatever it is, that we're going to be stuck with that. And um, I think Councilmember Donovan mentioned about requiring uh, uh, site concerns, and that's a very valid point. You know, can something be inserted saying that the planning board can deny any request if, in their judgment, the board uh, the board determines that the visual impact is not acceptable? 
I mean, there's got to be some, some meat in it, because otherwise, if something is passed and we have these minimum standards, <coughs> cell companies are going to come in, they're going to say, hey, we meet these minimum standards, we meet A, B, C, D, there's nothing here that prevents us on site impact, we don't have to answer to that issue. And to me, I, I would really appreciate it if the council would take the time necessary to get answers to a lot of these questions, to have this reviewed by the planning board. And if it means waiting for the new council to come in, I have no doubt that new council members as well as existing ones that come back a after November are as capable of getting up to speed quickly and being able to make these decisions uh, timely but yet taking the time it needs. This is a big deal. And I still have huge concerns over the fact that um, by the Black Point Road, we have five overlay zones that all appear to be adjacent to the ocean or the marsh. And we're going from allowing no towers in those areas to up to 150 feet. And to me, it's like it's gone from nothing to huge like this and I have a huge concern over anything near the ocean or the marsh at up to 150 feet off the Black Point Road. I, ju I, just, I just don't think it's good for the town. I, I think we're all going to have to live with it if this goes through, and I would, I would implore that you take the time necessary and reconsider these overlay zones near the ocean and the marsh. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Anyone else? Um, you got something quick, Sue? So? Well, yeah, actually, procedurally, um, I just. There's no procedure here. It's the, the procedurally, if you, the way you propose to do um, do it is if it was approved on the 15th and then to be adopted at such a date after the planning board. Procedurally, I don't believe that legally you could make amendments because the ordinance says that once you approve an ordinance, it cannot be substantially changed for a year. So I would be very careful about if this council adopts it on the 15th and you think that the planning board is allowed to give you input at such a date, and I also implore you to please, please, I beg of you, don't worry about a doggone election to do what's right for the community. That is just a cry and shame. It really is. This is about what's right for the people. It's not about what's right for an individual. It's about the right for the community. You take your time and do it the right way. But I also procedurally just wanted to point out that I don't think you could come back and make amendments based on the planning boards. And you can check it out with me. You can prove me wrong. But that's what I think the rules are. I think that was a misunderstanding what, what's going on. Um, okay. Since that will uh, close that session. Um, I guess the next step would be uh, to hear from counselors on direction. What the next the steps to take? It might be most efficient. I've been trying to keep track of <laughs> general <laughs> comments, things that I Sorry. seem to have Sorry. some consensus. Perhaps I could try to do that just to synthesize what I heard, wow. rather than going seven could times you, down the line. That would actually be amazing. So don't take this as though I don't think there was any, certainly no votes, there's no consensus, but these are themes that I've picked up along the way and things that um, are worth looking at between now and the next time you consider this. Uh, looking at the whole issue of uh, uh, inserting additional discretion to the planning board, uh, perhaps that would involve uh, instituting a minimum distance to existing structures. This has to do with siting a tower on that 25-acre lot. That, that's work that Dan and I could do and report back to you. Um, there was some conversation around requiring signage on buildings where telecommunication facilities reside, and that's something I think that we could add to the ordinance if the council wished, just as notification mm -hmm. to unsuspecting folks. Um, we're going to take a look at this whole DIS, DAS example and be a little clearer and better understood as to what level of review and rigors those kinds of telecommunication facilities would undergo. Th 
there was a fair amount of conversation around um, clarifying the review authority and maybe standardizing, whether it's all zoning board or all planning board, but one way or another making it clear for all towers and or facilities um, where they go. There was conversation around the 200 foot height limit in the industrial zone as to whether that would have a positive benefit as an incentive for towers to locate there and perhaps ideally uh, negate the need for other towers in the vicinity. And perhaps Ivan can help give us some guidance in that regard. And then there was more kind of questions or comments from councillors. Uh, Councillor St. Clair remember, uh, mentioned her concern with kind of the whole stealth applications. I didn't pick up any other exist any other interest to, to perhaps do that, but I just observed that, that was brought up. And the last piece that I took note of was this whole effective date. Um, I think if you were to do what uh, the chairman suggests, the council could take action if it wished, and you could set a specific effective date, uh, barring you setting a date. Otherwise, the the uh, your rules of procedures indicate how. Uh, I, I believe an ordinance is effective immediate, or 12 a.m. the following day. So we can set an effective date in the future? You could, yes. and I think as was mentioned at the podium, um, I don't believe if you've taken final action, even with a, uh, a delayed effective date, you'd have the ability to amend that. I, I think that is uh, a question or a point worth noting. So if, you're, if your desire is to, in fact, receive input from the planning board and such input would be important before you make, take final decision, you should not take final action um, on the 15th. If on, on the other hand, if your interest is to, and I know the chairman and at least one other member of the planning board have indicated general acceptability with what's in front of you now, mm -hmm. but they're interested in organizing themselves and coming up with some policies and procedures, uh, that wouldn't necessarily require council action. That's just allow them to get their house in order and be prepared for when applications come. That's a different matter. I can speak for that for just a quick second. Once again, re re go over it again. What it was was um, from talking with Alan Paul, it wasn't getting given feedback. What I was agreeing with Councilor Holbrook was we'd hear what the, how they were going to formulate their end of how it was going to work. It wouldn't be changes. It wouldn't be amendments coming back. They, uh, they agreed that they thought the proposal was pretty good. Um, if we had further changes um, to it, uh, they said the stronger it was, the better, and that they would just be formulating how they plan to deal with it because they're afraid that the very next, um, uh, the, at the very next planning board meeting, they'll have applications before them and be unprepared to act on them. So they want the time to um, have a workshop, go over, you know, the 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 entire ordinance with the proposed amendments as passed, if passed, and um, see how they're going to handle um, implementing what we have. And of course, they'll, you know, they'll, what they'll be telling us in a report is how they plan on implementing. Can I approach this maybe just slightly differently? I think between now and October, yeah. could we circulate to them and maybe just email, you know, any feedback they might have on it? You know, circulate it out to the board members and say, you know, due date of October 14th, if you have any feedback or recommendations, can you right. just let us know? Right. We have provided the drafts to yes. them. We've not yeah. we've not specifically said get us finish your comments by a certain date, but we can do that. Well, we Except for the overlay district, uh, what Dan has described has been out there for the last month. He's made this presentation at least three or four times yeah. in public. So <clears throat> my assumption has been the planning boards had plenty of chance <clears throat> to hear exactly where we're going and including the specific language that is now before us. But that what they really would like is to be able to get their ducks in a row to deal with applicants <clears throat> for us because this is all brand new for them and I would want to do that too. I'd want to 
have a little powwow beforehand to know exactly how we're going to deal with it. Mm -hmm. It's and it's not so much it's not that they want to change any of it at all. They just want to know how to implement it and um, how they're going to deal with um, what's in what's what's in right. Um, Tom, yes. I, I wasn't the only one that talked about the stealth, and what I did was I I asked for an I wanted a, an amendment written up. Can, can I request that? Uh, certainly, I can work with you individually. Yeah, yeah to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please recall everything we, yeah, I guess that would be an amendment because that's an existing standard. Right. So I'm pleased to work with you and have, Thank you. provide that to you and you can offer it as you yes. wish. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Mm-mm. Okay. Do, so um, just to recap, do, we do will we need to give direction to Tom as to those items that he bulleted? as to which ones we think should be more actively pursued. That would be helpful. Oh, well, I, thought I, I, thought <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were pursuing all of them. I thought you were pursuing all of them. Okay, yeah, I'm we'll prepared to work on all of them. Some of these I think we can provide some draft change, some specific language. Others, it remains to be seen whether it produces any uh, meaningful difference, if you will. But mm -hmm. uh, I've made note of them. There's two or three of these things that I think we will work on and will incorporate in the draft that's in front of you next week. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's where you left it. Yeah. At, so I thought we were all set on that. With mm -hmm. um, I just can't promise that we'll, we'll come up with solutions with, for all of these things. Mm -hmm. We've noted them and we'll look at them. Mm -hmm. and then. When, when you guys were well, going over it, I expected, I didn't hear any objections. So mm -hmm. I still see no objections. So. Okay. Anything else? Fine, thirty. Let's go home. That's right. Good. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I learned. I think that that makes sense. It's tonight. Yes.